Ladies and gentlemen, so excited to have you back on the Ben Stewart podcast. Today, we have somebody that is not only someone I've been deep diving into their podcast and their work for quite some time, but also somebody that I can call a friend. His name is Kyle Kingsbury. Kyle Kingsbury is a former Arizona State football player, a retired American professional mixed martial artist in the UFC for six years, former director of human optimization at Onnit, and host of the Kyle Kingsbury podcast. While fighting at the highest level, Kyle became fascinated with nutrition, performance, and recovery. Since his MMA retirement, his focus has shifted to learning more about longevity, plant medicines, inner peace, and man, is this going to be an amazing conversation. I was on his podcast not too long ago. It was incredible. I got a lot of people connecting with me after that one. I know this one's gonna be even better, so let's get to it on the Ben Stewart Podcast. And we are back. Kyle, so good to have you here, man. Yeah, this is amazing, brother. Thanks for having me on. It's been a couple of weeks in the work. And, you know, I like when these things are elusive. Like we finally mm. we finally got it together where both our paths aligned. So we got this podcast going. We Absolutely. Get, uh, Sorry for dodging you the last two weeks. I've had a number of things come up. So this is great that we actually get to sit down and do it. Dude, I just know that it will happen the next time you try and nail me down. So this is just the way it goes. I'm loving it, man. Gordo over here in the corner. What's going on, man? Hey, guys. Excited for this. I'm a big fan of uh, Kyle's podcast. We were having some cool riffs before about uh, some of the ceremonies. So there's a lot of good meaty stuff to bite into. Oh. For sure. You know, uh, Gordo, the first person I ever heard Kyle Kingsbury from was you, actually. I don't know if you remember at Gaia. You know, I was like f four desks away from you and you would just come over every now and then and chat. And you were talking to me about Aubrey Marcus podcast. You were talking to me about Kyle Kingsbury. I think at that point it might have been the uh, On It podcast. Um, but man, I dug in deep for a while. And um, I did. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of. Uh, a lot of family stuff and other things came up in, in the time being. And then all of a sudden, here I am going to Austin, connect with Christian Pity. He connects me with you. That connects me with Aubrey. That turns into this film. And there's just so much that we want to get into today, man. There's been so much happening this year, I'm sure, for the entire world. But um, let's, uh, let's just dive in, man. Yo, Kyle. So I want to, I don't want to move through this too quickly, but like, in the broad strokes of your bio, Arizona State football player, I want to know what position you played, um, how long you were playing, was that like your goal? What shifted you to the MMA? And then what in God's name shifted you to what you're doing today? <laughs> I can I, I can, I can, I can sum up this pretty quick. I started playing football when I was 10 and uh, wanted to play pro. That was always my goal and uh, really just learned as much as I could about strength and conditioning. Um, wasn't a super talented athlete, but loved the sport. And I ended up walking on at Arizona State. I finished my last two years there after playing junior college football and then hit rock bottom depression like I'd never had before. Uh, a lot of childhood stuff. And uh, in addition to that, just seeing, you know, kind of a grim outlook on not wanting to follow my parents' footsteps, both being in sales and living on commissions and, and just the swing of we've got money, we have nothing. Um, and didn't want to have a desk job, you know, so I wanted to continue to train in anything. I miss the camaraderie and the aspect of being on a team. So I started training in mixed martial arts. And uh, after about six months, one of the guys uh, at the gym that I was training at, he owned his own small promotion out in Arizona called Rage in the Cage. And he's like, dude, just fight. You're, you're handsome, you're big, and you're athletic. Uh, you can always say you had one pro fight to get your ass kicked. You don't have to ever do it again. But if you, if you do well, you can keep going and see where it takes you. And I, I knocked the first guy out in under 30 seconds. I knocked the second guy out in under 30 seconds. And from that point on, I was hooked. And so I started training really hard. I took my first loss out in Arizona. And being originally from the Silicon Valley, you know, uh, near San Jose, my strength coach reached out, reached out to me from Arizona State. And he's like, King. Barry, what are you doing? Go, go home. You got to go home and train at AKA the best in the world train there. Kane Velasquez is there. And Kane was uh, wrestling when I was playing football at Arizona state. We actually had a lot, a lot of guys in those classes. Oh, uh, four, Oh, five, Oh, six. 
become professional fighters that did really well in the UFC. And so I moved home, started training at NAK with Kane. Uh, Daniel Cormier came on board. Like we had the best of the best all in one house. I didn't become the best, but I always got to train with the best. And that was my first deep dive into, I mean, fighting lit my ass, a fire under my ass to want to learn more. And it started with optimization. You know, uh, I started learning about Wim Hof and breath work and different things like that, strictly for fighting and calming my mind, peace, meditation for fighting. Um, but I had a boxing coach who was uh, Mayan and, uh, you know, a mestizo mixed with uh, Mexican. And um, he he started working with us on the other side of things. You know, he'd bring me and Kane out for traditional sweat lodges. We'd do the Temes Call on a Native American reservation up in Northern California. And eventually I was like, hey, coach, when are we going to uh, use La Medicina? And he just burst out laughing and he said, oh, I've just been waiting for you to ask me. You know, and that, and that was it, dude. I started working with psilocybin and I was and it was like a whole fucking, as you know, a whole door opened up. Um, and, uh, you know, since then, I've, I've really let spirit guide me over the years. And it's, you know, every time I say yes, it pans out. You know, I mean, ayahuasca brought me here to Austin, Texas and told me I'd meet people. I met Aubrey Marcus when I was speaking at Paleo FX on health and wellness. And of course, he's the CEO and owner of On It at the time. And we shared the same flight back to Vegas where I was living at that time. And just traded war stories from plant medicines to fasting to all things health and wellness. And he's like, brother, I got to bring you on it, on it. And, um, it took some nudging, but he brought me and Tosh, my wife to uh, burning man. And that was it. <laughs> Checkmate. So, <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> so here we are, you know, and, and I've been podcasting for a while after going on Rogan's a couple of times in 2015, he nudged me as he does many people. And yeah. that's just continued my ability to learn from some of the best folks in the world, medical doctors to, um, you know, the best in sports and, and meditation experts and everything in between. So it's been uh, just an amazing experience that I feel very fortunate to have really just been floating along the ride for. I love it, bro. I love it. You know what I love the most about it is it, um, I recognize an element of your journey. You So you pushed yourself. Um, you were in these competitive sports where you really, really had to push yourself. Like if you're not in the top, what, 97 you know, percentile, like you're pretty, or, or I guess the top 3%, you're pretty much not going to be, and I could be overstating it by that, maybe top 1% of the people trying to get into the UFC or trying to get into Arizona State. Um, you really had to push yourself. But what I see in that is the same thing that kind of like, I was in a band pushing for that. And then the film thing came up and that's what kind of swept me away. And even though it was a little chaotic, because I felt like I was you know, wish-washy jumping from this profession to that profession, I noticed the through line in all of that was, I wouldn't call it human optimization unless you understand that that's actually a spiritual path, human optimization. And I kind of feel like that's where you were pushing as well, is like the, the competitive nature also had within it this thing that was calling you to keep transcending yourself, transcending your old limits. And um, it naturally brought you to plant medicines, which it, it naturally brought me to plant medicines. So I guess I want to ask other people who are in that you were training with, I think you said Cormier was in the same group. How many of them were hip to maybe not doing, but hip to the plant medicine world, what it meant to the, to the spirit, you know, and also how many people were trying it when you were training back then? How many other people did you feel had some kind of interest in it? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. You know, the the first, how do I put this? I'll put it this way. I had, I had some injuries in 2012 when I really started working with ayahuasca. And injuries kept me from fighting until 2014. So I had a two-year layoff. And in that time, really had moved past fighting in a way. The reason why I had that final fight is because I wanted to see, like, can I bring my quiet mind into the fight? How does that change things? Mm -hmm. And I did bring my quiet mind. I got my ass kicked to my bullpen. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I guess it didn't, it didn't change the outcome per se. I just didn't care, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, ayahuasca, of course, allowed me to transition gracefully without being attached to that. And um, how I viewed it at that point was, you know, this is an amazing tool. I mean, I wanted to shop from the mountaintops. Like, this exists. Like I, people don't know this exists, this experience exists in the human body. This is insane. And, um, you know, like most people, uh, really wanted the world to try it. 
And but I was very clear. I understood that it wasn't something for fighters if they really gave a shit about their career. Don't do it while you're fighting. That has that opinion has not changed. If you were, when you're retired, for sure, have at it. But while you're fighting, if that's the most important thing in the world to you, I don't recommend guys do that. You know because it, it can shift that, and maybe that's a net positive. But um, you know, I mean, we're all called to the medicine. We're called to the medicine. At that time, I think I was the only guy at American Kickboxing Academy that was you know really dabbling with that. We had a lot of guys doing the sweat lodge. A lot of guys were curious, but. Um, no one participated with me from the fight world, you know, since then. Um, and I, I know he has no problem with me talking about it. Cain Velasquez, you know, reached out to me and said that he had his first journeys with ayahuasca and uh, Sonoran Desert Toad. Those are pretty big boy. You know, those are those are mm-hmm. some big medicines, you know, and, and he had just nothing but gratitude. He, he said that I was with him through it the whole way and, you know, really thanked me for, for being in his ear about it for so many years to no avail, you know, when he was ready. He crossed that threshold. You know Rashad Evans and mm-hmm. um, Chuck Liddell and a lot of the guys, you know, a lot of the, you know, my heroes, the guys that I loved watching, uh, guys that I've been able to train with, you know, like Chuck over the years that they've um, participated recently. And, and uh, I know Rashad is, is definitely not a rookie when it comes to plant medicines, but also, you know, coming in his retirement. So mm-hmm. I think the word is, is out and a lot of pe- more people are doing it now than, than when I first started back in 2009 ish. Um, it was probably just less well known, less popular. Yeah, man. Um, <clears throat> that's a really good point. You know, we, we had, I think I already told you this, we had Rashad on the podcast and, um, we actually mentioned you and he said, yeah, man, love Kyle. And, uh, and I said, well, we should definitely get you on Kyle's podcast. So we gotta, we gotta hook that up at some point. He's got some incredible stories. Um, and, uh, yeah, man. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much more I can say about that. But like, I I, I am familiar with uh, some of Rashad's history in that, and like shared some space with him. He's like, all I can say is I had an amazing experience where I couldn't tell if I was actually seeing him or not, and he was standing up and he was disappearing, reappearing, like he had this shawl over him and he was opening up, shutting it. It looked like Batman flying around. It was incredible. And um, I had like three odd mystical experiences with him in the course of an hour in that experience. So um, maybe at some point we'll do some kind of like after hours uh, exclusive content where we can start getting into stories. Um, with that, um, what I wanted to say is actually, I wanted to circle back around in this, but I, I put into the chat, does anyone have any questions for Kyle and destiny rocks asks, was it exercise medicine or the right person or persons that pulled you out of your depression or something else? This is a great question. Um, I mean, I, I did hit rock bottom. I had, uh, I had a functional medicine doctor really, or yeah, what's the term for it? Natural path. And he gave me whatever the fuck I wanted. And I was taking like all kinds of steroids to be huge in football. I weighed 268 pounds. I played defensive line. Um, But I had 10 milligram Valium, 2 milligram Xanax, the big ones, uh, hydroxycodone, Vicodin. You know, I had anything I wanted. He was giving me the 60 count. You know, like I'd have a lot of it. Sometimes I'd trade it for ecstasy. Uh, I was doing Coke on the weekends. I mean, it was full on party party scene. And, um, you know, when football ended, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. And, and in a combination with a lot of other things, I, I really dive into detail on uh, episode 12 of my podcast. It was a solo cast where I dove deep into it. But without getting too deep on that, uh, I attempted my own suicide. So I, I took every pill that I had. I swallowed them all, drove the top of parking lot seven at Arizona State and went to jump. And that was the first time where I actually felt the presence of God. Oh, it wow. might have been the pharmaceuticals, but this wash came over me and it just let me know not yet. That's the only thing I heard was not yet. And it was like, I even questioned it like what? And it was not yet. So it gave me the answer, like the peace that I seek in death will come, but not yet. And at that moment, the the security guard popped his head up and he was like, Hey man, uh, can you come down? And he's like, Whoa, you're naked. (laughs) I stripped down. I was like, yeah, let me throw on my robe. And then I woke up in, uh, what my mom calls the loony bin with, uh, (laughs) other people that were in similar situations and slowly started to scrap back. I was sober for a period of time. And, you know, 
fighting was the impetus for me to take care of myself. Like one night, even just drinking alcohol, if I drank, it would destroy my cardio. And fighting is so demanding. It was far more demanding than football. Football, I could get away with a lot of drug use. And fighting, I couldn't. You know, I had to be, it gave me a reason to take care of myself. And as I took care of myself physically, and I had an outlet to get rid of the, you know, to move that energy, the anger and the pain that allowed me to process things. And even though I hadn't really chunked at my past um, until the plant medicine work, which came three or four years into my professional fighting career, it was enough for, for me to want to take care of myself, knowing that somebody's going to try to take my head off. And if I'm, if I'm slacking and, and, you know, putting bad stuff in my body, uh, it's not going to work out. So, you know, and all at the same time, I got introduced to Paul check through, uh, my strength and conditioning coach. I had a lot of gas and he was like, you, you, he's also a New Yorker. He goes, you fought a lot. And I was like, that's a weird fucking thing to say to a dude in a gym. Like every, all guys fart. Right. And he's like, no, no, you got some kind of intolerance. <laughs> and, uh, he had me watch the flatten your abs forever video on VHS. And I'm like, oh, this is dope, dude. I don't be shredded like this guy. You know, I'm trying to cut weight now for fighting and I don't need to be huge anymore. And uh, watch the video. It has nothing to do with being shredded. It has everything to do with gut health, the gut brain oh, axis, wow. um, food intolerances, the whole thing. And so I went on Czech's elimination diet and it changed my life. It absolutely changed. It, it planted the seed in the knowing that what I put in my body has a direct correspondence to how I think, how I feel, and how I operate. And it was well beyond recovery. Like my ability to retain information, like I got smarter almost immediately by eliminating things that my body didn't agree with. And, um, you know, just those changes, I was hooked. I read how to eat, move and be healthy. I went through the questionnaires several times, uh, like every three months I'd, you know, every quarter I'd go back through the questionnaires and check in and see how my scores are. And, um, you know, for anybody that doesn't know, that's the Bible of health and wellness, how to eat, move and be healthy. And along the way, took HLC one, uh, holistic lifestyle coaching, not for me to, to have that in my repertoire as a coach at that point, I was still just fighting, but it was, um, really just for me. And I learned so much in that too. And Paul in the HLC series bridges to the spiritual, you know, he, he really dives deep into the psychology, the emotions and everything that comes with that in health. And that's really kind of how my podcast transitioned to from largely based on optimization and athleticism to all things health and wellness, which of course, you know, plant medicines are included in that. Um, Psychology is included in that. Meditation, stillness, how we find peace inside is all a part of that. But it's kind of hard to point at any one singular aspect, but fighting definitely was the reason that it it guided me out. It gave me a reason to want to live again. Damn, dude, what what a story. There's many things that come up to me um, with that. For one, I I got Paul's book right here, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. Um, We just had him on the show not too long ago. You and I just hung out with him. Um, Probably can't go deep into uh, that experience, but um, what an incredible human being, um, Paul Check, for one. On top of that, Man, I've been there. I've like, you know, I don't have as as cool of a story as you as as to how I got out of my depression. Um, or maybe cool is not the right words, but like, you know, a memorable story that is right there. Um, but I like I remember those depths and I never went to a doctor. I, I never went and sought any kind of um, you know, fix for it for some reason. I I I think I even went straight edge, not for the, you know, allure or the, you know, the, the visual appeal of it, but I went straight edge because I was trying to figure it out myself. But uh, there's a couple things I want to ask. What year was that? And, and we don't have to throw anyone under the bus. This, this show is all about respect. Um, but you said you went to a naturopath and then you named a bunch of things that just does not typically cross my mind when I think naturopath, as far as I think you said, like the Oxycontins, the, uh, the anti-anxiety pills, stuff like that, the, the steroids clarify. I mean, maybe you don't have to get too deep into that. Cause again, like, you know, maybe he's, a, he's a listener or something like that, but like kind of clarify that for me. How did a naturopath turn into that? And around what age were you, what year was this? <laughs> 
this is there. You know, I'm I'm, a, I'm an open book. I'm happy to talk about it. Believe it or not, I actually don't even remember the guy's name. Maybe that's from all the Xanax <laughs> in the party. <laughs> yeah, but, that might be a side uh, Nothing makes you forget like Xanax. But he, um, you know, my friend turned me on to him, and he was like, "This is the way you can get steroids legally." You know, and I was taking them illegally since I was 17 years old to try to play in the NFL. And I'm, I'm, I'm built, you know, since I was a junior in high school, this exact same build, I'm more, more veins now and stuff from working out over the years and doing altitude training, but I'm 6'3", 225. So knowing I wasn't going to have the speed to play linebacker, I wanted to hit the gas and get big. And uh, this was a way I could do it legally and I could do blood work and make sure my liver and kidneys were functioning correctly. And all that stuff mattered to me. Even at a young age, I was looking at, you know, this is a short window of my life. I don't want to, you know, kill myself in the process and die when I'm 60. And, you know, looking at all the pro wrestlers that have gone, um, that was something that was on my mind, you know? So Mm -hmm. it was good in that respect. The, the other drugs, you know, the, the, the pharmaceuticals were really the big deal. I mean, obviously, you know, when you're taking that level of anabolic steroids, that too is a yo-yo that too causes all kinds of emotional swings and roller coasters. And especially if one has not dealt with their past, you know, so looking at all that, um, I mean, it was the perfect storm. There's no doubt. I don't know why as a natural path, he was prescribing anything and everything. Like I literally just ask him for whatever I wanted. He say, sure. Um, and then I'd see him the next month or two and I'd be like, Hey, I'm, I'm going through these pretty quickly. And be like, all right, I'll bump up your prescription. And then I max out on quantity and it's like, Hey, is there a stronger version of this? And yeah, you can actually go up to two milligrams. You want to do that? Yeah, let's do that. So literally he just said yes to whatever. There was no boundary there. And, um, he even knew that I was doing party drugs on the weekend. You know, I was like, well, I need a stronger Xanax because of the amount of cocaine I have. (laughs) It's just like, I mean, in hindsight, it's like, what, what on earth? Like, seriously, like, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was gnarly. Um, one of my friends actually died from an overdose and um, that doctor went to jail. You know, I don't know if wow. it was directly from my friend dying, but um, yeah, you know, that story didn't end well either. You know, and I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. Obviously I'm um, laughing about certain things. That was, that was a hard thing. We weren't allowed to attend his funeral because his parents blamed his friends for wow. his addictions. And um that was really hard. I remember I was flying back from Chicago and I found out from, uh, I found out on the phone in an airport that I had to sleep in that night. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, I, I don't know. I know the guy's not in practice anymore, thankfully. Wow. Um, but yeah, he was not practicing good medicine, not by any means. No, for sure. And I mean, like men, uh, like I feel like there's a perfect segue to what we're talking about right now, all the way leading up to today. Um, I kind of want, uh, you know, maybe Gordo, maybe you can help us explain a little bit more. I heard this on Tim Pool this morning, but you sent me something about like what's what's going on today and, and what we can and can't talk about in the forms of, you know, health and wellness um, conversations today. Do you want to just fill us in on like the news and maybe we can carry forward in that direction? Yes. Yeah, so just to give people a little bit of reference for this, um, sorry, let me pull up the article. Uh, essentially, this is, and this is just important, I think, for people to know if, if you're in any way associated with YouTube in any way. Um, but basically, there was a recent, this was the article, or this was the uh, video that I watched talking about it that I recommend to people from Breaking Points. But um, YouTube released a new I don't know if it's officially been released. I think it is. Here's the release right here. But essentially, it's saying that it's delegated its moderation of fortune policies to medical consensus, whatever that means exactly. So this new rule is in particular is vague and could potentially get you banned. So um, in particular, any claims that that, uh, you know, vaccines do not re- reduce transmission, transmission or contraction of the, de- of the disease are the key thing they're going after. So. The bottom line is why this is obviously really sketchy and YouTube has a has a long track record of this is they're being very vague and broad with the term medical consensus. And as we know right now, there's a lot of conflicting scientific studies from both sides of the aisle about the efficacy of vaccines and various other, um, you know, for instance, Brett Weinstein and Heather Heyer being a big voice going on Rogan and talking about it. So um, there's no medical consensus. 
is the bottom line. We don't have like 100% medical consensus on this. So um, just giving that out to the people in the YouTube sphere, uh, be mindful of that. I know The Pulse and Joe Martina, I think just got a two week ban for this. So yeah. it is what it is. We obviously have to, we've talked about this on the channel and being smart about what we do on YouTube and on the website and various other creators are taking that approach. There's new platforms like Rumble and others popping up to fill this. But um, yeah, that's a little update for people. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, man. And you know, like, it's not like we're gonna go directly in that direction, but I, I guess um, <clears throat> one of the questions I was gonna ask Kyle is because you you found yourself using your voice. Like, man, like I, I'm gonna go back through your bio, like Arizona State University, a lot of people, they they that's the highlight of their life. Then UFC, a lot of other people, that's the highlight of their life. And to me, these are launch pads into a, a spiritual direction for you, um, a, a humble direction. And knowing you for just as long as I've known you now, you're also like not only one, one of the most like fit people I know, but also one of the more intelligent and also like one of the more sensitive, which is this, this is a strange, like you're, you, you're really a specimen of a human being in that respect. And, and what I want to say that I loved when I went on your podcast was that we dove straight into the deep end almost right away. And we splashed around in there for a while, but mainly what we were talking about was not, um, based in fear. We, we were talking about like, this is the kind of the world that we, you know, we seem to be in, but what are the solutions? What can I, the, you know, the human being do? So that story that you just told about, like you, you had to take some action into your own hands about, um, you were rock bottom and then you realized that a change needed to be made. How did that end you up talking for a living, you know, doing a podcast, sharing your mind, sharing your thoughts, and also navigating what Gordo just shared with us about like this ever-changing world about what you can and cannot talk about. <laughs> this is a beautiful segue. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I was actually in a mushroom journey. It's funny we can talk about mushrooms, but we can't talk about other certain things. Right. I was in a mushroom journey uh, at a beach in Santa Cruz, Wilder State Park, one of my favorite places. Um, there's not a lot of people there. We, my wife and I walked down this little cove. It was a fairly deep journey, and it was after I'd been on Rogan's, and he, he recommended starting the podcast, and I was really sitting with that. And it got kind of dark, and the this question that just come, kept coming up in my mind was, what the fuck do you know? And it was like, oh, God, I don't know anything. <laughs> it was deep, deeply humbling. And... Um, really hard, but I, I realized I have a, I'm kind of like a jack of all trades, you know, and, and I've, I, I've gotten so much that I've learned through books and through experts. But I, one of the things that I pride myself on is the fact that I practice everything. You know, I want to be the living embodiment of what I learn. And I think that's made, you know, a difference through everything. When I was at, on it, I was the office guinea pig, like anything I was going to talk about, I was going to try on for size. And that gave me more content. That gave me more things to, to talk about. And from a personal, you know, from an N equals one standpoint. And so just continuing on that path, I continue to learn. Fighting gave me a big impetus to want to read and learn more. I read more books in my fighting career than I ever did in college and previous. And since uh, retiring from fighting in 2014, that hasn't changed, you know. Um, I've always had a thirst for knowledge and you know having the space in my schedule to really be able to practice these things makes all the difference in the world so i know definitively for me n equals one what works what doesn't what works best and and the ability to really convey that to people um you know getting more towards this current topic over the last year and a half there's been a lot of people especially in my field in health and wellness people that you know a lot of the people that i was speaking with at paleo fx who understand things pretty clear and understand that you know, what we're being told, the narrative that's going around uh, at minimum raises more questions than answers at minimum, you know, but the, the more we dive deep into the rabbit hole, the, the clearer, you know, this, this really becomes. And thanks to documentaries and thanks to, um, people who know science and actually can look at it, you know, like I, I have friends who have like t-shirts to say science is real, you know, in Austin, <laughs> there's, there's, uh, 
you know, there, there's the, 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 the placards that are put in people's front yards to say black lives matter. Love is love. Science is real. And it just goes down that list. But something that most people forget right now is that the very nature of science is to question the very mm-hmm. nature of science is to poke holes. This is why we have a peer review that and obviously placebo effect, but the peer review is meant the double blind is the placebo. The peer review is to poke holes in it and say, Hey, something looks amiss with this. And certainly, I mean, you know, with the guests that I started transitioning towards on my podcast, um, all of them were active medical doctors. You know, it's not like I'm talking to a chiropractor mm-hmm. who also could have very good information about these things. And they're allowed to have their opinion themselves. I was bringing medical doctors on the show and um, continuing to dive deep into the rabbit hole and, and uh, take the red pill, as they say, you know, and that's, that's furthered my understanding of all this in a way that really does make sense. It's not a happy place to be, you know, for a year, it really took me down mentally and physically. You know, I, I didn't let it break me down all the way because I have two kids and a wife. Um, and my wife, you know, carried the squad on her back for a little bit of that, you know, while I had to really figure out how to navigate this water and, uh, understand my place in it. But, you know, some of the guests that I've had on from Mickey Willis to Dale Big Tree to Dr. David E. Martin, Dr. Kirk Parsley, you know, and JP Sears, of course, who's been phenomenal through this, really gave me the courage to want to stand up and speak. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'm reading the Gulag Archipelago right now. Jordan Peterson's <laughs> been right about so much of this stuff. You know, five, six years ago, he was talking about this on Rogan's what censorship actually looks like, where it leads. And uh, he called it way ahead of time, you know, because of the books that he had read. And, and reading the Gulag Archipelago was just like the single in the first chapter, they get to it. The single biggest problem that they had was that no one spoke out. As mm-hmm. that everyone acquiesced. Everyone said, no, I'm, I'm, this is a wrongful arrest. Surely they'll figure this out once I get to jail. They'll see that I committed no crime and I'll be released. Well, 25 years goes by or gunshot to the head or torture in between that. And that's not how it worked out for quite a bit of the population under Lenin and Stalin. And, and unfortunately, these are the these is this is what the writing on the wall is showing us right now. And there's different names for it, as you know and your listeners know. Some people call it the Great Reset. Some people call it Agenda 2030. Some people call it uh, Build Back Better, as we've heard as a wonderful slogan that all the powers that be like to throw around at all means. Yeah, it's, it all means new world order. I mean, it all means totalitarian control. And unfortunately, transhumanism is transhumanism is a big part of this. The man's merging uh, with AI interfaces, and that again spells more for control. So, you know, the why behind this. People say if you follow the money, it's easier to see. Um, there's an excellent documentary called Thrive and Thrive Two. Yeah. That um, you know our buddies have done. Kyle Tierman introduced me to that. He's a good friend of mine. His stepfather, Foster Gamble, and uh, and mother made those documentaries, and they're fantastic documentaries. They really break this stuff down. Um, and also do a great job of bridging into the light, you know, to, to say like, this is what we do. This is how we get back to sustainable living, how we take care of the planet, how we first take care of ourselves through organic and biodynamic farming. And, um, you know, all the principles of Paul check, the last four doctors you'll ever need is a fantastic ebook. That's very short for people to understand. Like if you live by the principles of these four doctors, Dr. Movement, Dr. Quiet, Dr. Diet and Dr. Happiness, you don't need to see a doctor. Like you, you're good. Those are your four doctors, adequate sleep and meditation for Dr. Quiet, organic food and clean water for Dr. Diet and, uh, whatever your movement practices is from yoga to running, to lifting weights, to martial arts, any of these things that's your doctor movement dance. Um, and then Dr. Happiness, what is your dream? What are you building and working towards? How are you filling your cup each day and, and, uh, inching towards your path and your dreams when you've got all those ducks in a row, you have perfect health. And I can say like between me, my wife and our two kids, we are completely healthy. My kids have never had a jab, completely healthy. And I've read, I can give you a laundry list of references why we chose to do that from books like Dissolving Illusions by medical doctor Suzanne Humphreys to the Nourishing Traditions book of Baby and Child Care by Dr. Thomas Cowan and Sally Fallon, who runs the Weston A. Price Foundation in New York City. Uh, The list goes on and on. But, you know, the point is that 
understanding health is fundamentally our right and our responsibility is a different way to view it than I expect, you know, this sick care system to take care of me. And the next invention is going to get me, uh, give me my get out of jail card for not taking care of myself. That's not how it works. Health doesn't come in a jab. It doesn't come in a pill. And I've been on both sides of the fence with that. You know, I've had, <laughs> I've had the pills. I've lived that experience and I've lived this experience and it's a whole different world. Yeah, man, dude, awesome. it's a, uh, health is a lifestyle. Health is a a lifestyle and a series of decisions and, and choices. And what I love about what you said is actually something that Paul Check even mentioned, because we got onto this where you were saying like, you know, listen, I, I, I absorb a lot of what I read and I, I um, do my best to become a living example of that. Um, but there was, <clears throat> I think it was in um, vocation series that Paul Check did on his where he just speaks he doesn't have a guest on he's just talking about vocation and how vocation is voice but he also talks about how he gets a lot of people saying hey i want to be a uh, you know a health coach but i could never do that right now i mean look at me i'm still slightly overweight i've only been doing your course for maybe a year and a half and i don't i don't look phenomenal yet um i haven't ticked off all the boxes that i need to to get myself in optimal shape and paul tells these people Listen, you are farther along down the road than most people who haven't done anything yet. And maybe I, Paul Check, you know, who have, have gotten to all those check boxes that, you know, you said you haven't, maybe I would be less relatable to some people. You need to pick up the torch. You need to use your voice. And what I love about what you're saying is the cool thing about a podcast is you're able to you know, if you're well read enough, you can keep up with a conversation with somebody who's who's, you know, going from their very technical um, academic background and filtering it down to lay person speak. You can have an incredible conversation that way. So that's how you've been sharing your gift um, and really speaking about health and speaking about what's going on in the world is I think what you've done is also showed as an example this is how the average person, not that by any stretch of the imagination, you've had an average life or anything like that, but just taking it like anybody coming from any background can go in this direction and optimize their health by taking health into their own hands rather than outsourcing it to, you know, whatever that might be, you know, whether you call that the government, whether you, whether you call that, you know, healthcare industry, whatever it might be, if you are not understanding of those four doctors, if you don't take that into your own control and you outsource it and you say, well, you know what, I'll be healthy and I'll live a long life. Why? Because I go to the doctor and he or she tells me what to do. That's not really well-being. That may be health in some stretch, <clears throat> but that's not really well-being. And I think well-being as a part of that whole health and well-being phrase has to do with, are we, are we really living into our gifts and are we living into our potential? Um, and I, I, that's, it's not really a question. I just want to honor the fact that like, you've done also what I attempt to do, which is with no academia, you know, certificates behind here. Uh, you know, this is, this is my certificate, the psych psychedelica poster, right? I am an avid researcher because I love this stuff. I love these topics and I love this new movement where just about anybody, not that everybody does it, but just about anybody can start a podcast. But if you want it to actually last, if you want to actually do a good job and build something out of it, you really do have to learn a few things. You have to learn what's valuable to people and how to actually give them value. And that's why I see that the Kyle Kingsbury podcast is is badass. I think everybody should go out and listen to it, especially the episode where I was on it. That was such <laughs> a good, it, it was just such a good conversation. So man. Um, so with that being said, I, I also want to get to um, the Scriblon Society in the chat said, can you talk about flow states of grappling and sparring? And he says, and uh, ninja movements as medicine, playfulness. So I would love to know your um, movement routines, your movement habits, all the way down to the nuanced stuff that other people might not think, you know, whether that's retracting your gut before sitting down or whatever. I would love to know your routine. And also, as he said, you know, um, flow state, playfulness, the medicine of movement. I'd love to know your thoughts on that. 
Absolutely. That's a fantastic question, too. I, you lost me when you read his handle. I was like, wait, wait, what? Who's Squib what? <laughs> like, Squib not, on society. Like, I'm going to be dumbfounded trying to answer this. But no, that's a fantastic <laughs> question. You know, of, of hundreds of journeys with plant medicines, one of the most consistent themes that's come up for me uh, over and over again when I wasn't honoring it was play. And that cannot be overstated. It is simply one of the reasons why we're here to experience and to play. And um, any time where I have not been in harmony with that has been something that's that's been just you know <laughs> either gently or harshly thrust in front of my my attention and awareness. So really, that's that's what it is now. I don't train like I used to in terms of um, the way I used to bust my ass and, and really what's required to to fight at that level but I make sure I enjoy all of it, mm. you know, and, and because I've learned so much from the podcast from different people and, and the people I've been able to train with, even after fighting, you know, like Gabby Reese and Lord Hamilton, uh, working in the pool, doing CO2 retention, Brian Wilson and Rob McKenzie, who started art of breath at powerspeedendurance.com, no affiliation with them, but these guys are phenomenal breath coaches, uh, specific to sport. You know, these things are directly tied not only to our health and our sense of well being. They can create a state change, you know. So these are things that I incorporate. Um, I pretty much cherry pick the stuff that works best for me, and I've and I've been able to make that, you know, bridge that throughout my day. So if I I take a page out of Aubrey Marcus's book, um, and now I'm drawing a blank on it, but I, it's, you remember the title of that book? Oh, um, the, uh, something about the day, own the day, own the right? day, own your life, right? So the, the yeah. premise of that book is how do you create the perfect 24 hour cycle? And, you know, helping them with that book, that's really something that I've tried to embody. How do I create the, tw the perfect 24-hour cycle? Now, it always changes. Anyone who has kids knows that's going to change. <laughs> uh, anyone who has a regular job or, or an odd job, you know, my job, some days I'm in the office for six hours. Some days I just take the day off and do whatever I want. So that type of, um, um, that type of freedom doesn't lead to consistency. And consistency and routine are not just important for kids. They're not just important for the elderly. Like we know they're important for people in hospice care. We know they're important. Structure is super important for kids. But we think that somehow in the middle of our lives that just doesn't apply. It's 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 especially in times like these, super important. Routine and ritual uh, are things that can guide us, and that leads to flow. You know, so mm -hmm. how I structure this day actually matters. And uh, a couple months back. You know, we have uh, a one-year-old now, and, and a few months back, my wife Natasha was like, we have to get up before the kids do. It's the only way we're going to fill our cup and start the day right, and it's the only time we have completely to ourselves. I want you, So we have a sauna and an ice bath and this big barrel sauna with an 8-kilowatt heater. It'll get up to 230 degrees, so it's, it's, it's really hot, and we have a, an ice bath from the plunge, and that's really cold. And I'll, I'll get in there first thing in the morning. I wake up at 5 a.m., and I do an hour in there. I do uh, some stretching, a lot of the stuff from Mobility Wad. Dr. Kelly Sturette is, in my opinion, the best for mobility. So I'll, I'll work on my shoulders, neck, all the fascia in my face. And I do that really hot and sweaty from the sauna and the ice bath. That's my, my morning movement. Then I'll walk the kids and make breakfast while my wife does that. And uh, being in nature at sunrise is, is incredible for circadian rhythm. It's incredible for peace of mind. Um, I think one of the things Richard Rudd talks about in Gene Keys is if you picture this triangle, on, on one side of it, we have meditation. And uh, there we go. We'll see for the people watching. We have meditation at one point. We have concentration at the other point. And where these guys bridge in the middle is contemplation. And that's phenomenal while you're walking in nature. And even, you know, living in the suburbs of Austin, um, it's a city. I feel the city vibes. I feel you know, the electricity of the city, but we've got Cooper's Hawks, we've got Cardinals, we've got a lot, a lot of stuff that pulls me back into nature. And, and Texas is, has amazing weather. You know, we have all four seasons. We just had, we consistently get thunder and lightning storms. So that draw being outside rain or shine is one of the most critical pieces of my day. It allows me to set the tone for the day and clear my mind. And, um, from there, it just depends on what I'm doing that day. There's some form of movement every day one of the things that I absolutely love from a weightlifting standpoint for people who enjoy it is if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to be consistent with it. But for people who love weightlifting and you're not um, a power lifter or a very sports specific shot putter, things like that, the book Easy Strength by Pavel Tatsulin and Dan John 
is one of my all time favorites. It's something that I've really been practicing where, you know, one of the key concepts in that book is if it's worth doing, do it every day. And so you, you could easily say this about meditation or breath work, sauna, ice bath. Um, but pretty much every day I do some form of strength and conditioning five days a week. And then on the other days, I'm still moving. I might go for a jog. I might do um, some bag work. You know, I still practice Muay Thai in that sense. I'm not sparring or doing this. You know, I don't want to get any more knocks to the noggin. But really, that's um, that's where I find my joy and peace is just in moving freely. Uh, you know, we do a lot of ecstatic dances. Aubrey hosts, you know, at Fit for Service, which we'll dive into. But also outside of that, Austin's a great town for uh, – there's a pretty large community – community of people that want to just dance freely and there's no judgment. Nobody thinks you're weird. You know, like I'm certainly dance weird and that's okay. (laughs) It move into those spaces is so freeing. It it just really clears out and, and, and it opens me up. So where I might be stiff and tight from weightlifting, I counter that with yoga and I counter that with dance. And I think that's been uh, such an important piece for me because, you know, I had on medicine, uh, uh, a real deep dive into bamboo, you know, and Bruce Lee is, famous for saying be like water but i saw this inherent strength in the bamboo and the inherent flexibility and mobility of the bamboo when the storm came in uh we've got some really awesome 30 foot tall uh, bunch bamboo in our backyard and the the winds were so strong it blew it over at a 90 degree turn like from the base this got blown over 90 degrees it didn't crack it didn't break you know so um that that to me hit hard exactly what I want to embody. And so, you know, if I feel like I'm a little too stiff and I'm getting really strong, then I know where I'm out of balance and I'll focus more on mobility, stretching, Theragun, whatever I can get my hands on to open me up, body work. And uh, of course, the sauna and the ice bath are a big, big part of that because that allows me to really get deep in these two minute, three minute stretches and open my body up with the fascial plane. So I'm speaking mostly about the body right now as it pertains to movement, but you know, I've, I've lifted weights for so long that now when I lift weights, that is flow state. That is something where it just locks me in. It's not, I'm not going for PRs. I'm not trying max effort, but easy strength has a program, you know, it's, and, and if you read that book and you're interested in it, like you'll see that that is automatic flow. It's one of the books that, you know, really changed my life and it's allowed me to continue to train through injuries and, and, you know, old nagging body parts from my long career in football and fighting that brings me flow. Yoga brings me flow. Dance brings me flow. Playing with my kids brings me flow. You know, one of the things Ben Greenfield taught me, uh, who's been on my show quite a few times, was that at four o'clock, he's done with work no matter what. He turns his phone off or he he doesn't even have it on him. And he teaches his kids everything they're not learning in school. He'll take them out back. They do wild food foraging. They look at different mushrooms and determine if they're edible or not. Um, he teaches them how to shoot with the bow. I mean, he does all these things with his twin boys with no chance of interruption. And that, that's been really critical for me because we live in a time where everything is fast and, and we've got these things connected to us that, um, you know, if we're not careful, they run our lives, absolutely mm-hmm. run our lives. So really being able to be clear on that, thinking about the archetype of the warrior, you know, to have clear boundaries around uh, what I'm doing, and if I'm fully invested in it or not, have made a lot of difference in my ability to fully engage with life and whatever that is, whether it's a workout for me or playing with my kids, I'm there. My presence and awareness is there fully. And when you when you sign up for something like that and you bring your presence there, that's one of the prerequisites for flow. And it's one of the prerequisites for play. You know, if my mind's stretched in several different directions, I have to do my best to clear that before I get to my kids. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I'm just going to be thinking about that stuff while I'm trying to play with them. And it's all a work in progress. You know, my son's six. I've made a shit ton of mistakes with him. Um, my daughter is uh, 14 months now, and I've made far less mistakes with her. And that's just the nature of it. You know, something I tell my son is I'm doing a much better job than my dad did. My dad did a whole a heck of a lot better job than granddad did. And you're going to do a much better job than I'm doing right now. Mm. And uh, as long as we keep you know, working towards that trajectory, which we are, then we have healing. We heal generational trauma and um, we're able to really plant seeds for the future. Khalil Gibran uh, wrote The Prophet and his his short essay and poem on kids 
is one of the most fantastic things a, a parent could ever read because it really helps us understand what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish as parents. Mm -hmm. Totally. That's yeah, one of my favorite poems. I remember that part. Yeah. Talking yeah. about how, um, I can pull it up. you know, we, we don't own them. You know, we, we help them along their trajectory, something about an arrow and, and we help aim that arrow. Um, what's interesting is there's a, there it is on children. Yeah. Everyone who's, uh, who's watching definitely check that one out. I've, I've spoken to some people, um, who are in the religious community who, um, they like Khalil Gibran, but they don't, talk about it <laughs> so um bittersweet but but um actually the film with aubrey marcus that i'm working on right now uh it's a it's a beast but it's it's called awaken the darkness and there's a there's a passage from khalil gibran that says um every man is is two men and obviously he's talking about humans um one is uh I like it doing it the wrong way, which is the other way around. One is uh, asleep in the asleep in the light, and the other is awake in the dark. Uh, awake in the darkness, and that became the title of the film. Awake in the darkness. Um, that's going to be incredible. And speaking about Aubrey, you mentioned fit for service. Um, I would love to know more because as you were talking about play, you were talking about your movement routine and everything like that, and then you mentioned dance and these celebratory aspects of movement. It's not just movement for the sake of movement, which is good. There's a discipline inside that. But sometimes like breaking out of the rigidity with your movement, celebrating by dancing and um, really just letting the moment move you. Um, I know that you guys do a lot of that with music and with dance, with um, with Fit for Service. I've gone through a lot of the Fit for Service footage for the film and there's every single one of them, there's a dance party. And I, I freaking love that. There's poetry, yeah. there's a dance party. Um, th these are all health conscious people that are there for one another, helping people move through healing spaces. Just incredible. I would love to know what are your, what are the, the, the main elements that you are so impressed by with Fit for Service and what it's offering humanity? That's a big one. Um, yeah, you know, we we what we do is we take like-minded individuals that want to grow and want to learn, and we give them the kitchen sink. We give them everything that we know, the things that we've tried over and over again, and started, you know, have some degree of mastery and perfection with, and we we offer those. Obviously, only the legal practices as far as um, yep. taking a deep dive, but you know, we have guided holotropic breath work with Anahata out in Sedona. We've had. Parangi lead ecstatic dances. Parangi is just one of the greatest musicians alive right now. Fantastic. Um, you know, we really draw in experts. I mean, we've had Paul Selig out for a live channeling. So we're we're we take people through all forms of wellness, from physical to mental, emotional, into the spiritual, and we give people breakthrough experiences that are felt, that are life changing. And you know, these summits basically we we take people on trimester by trimester. Some of them have stayed with us all three years. The content changes each year. We format it at the end of the year, what the next year will look like, and we take people through it. And what's amazing, you know, and, and not surprising to me at this point is that as we formulate what we're going to teach the next year, that then <laughs> we got to start embodying, you know, and, and I really get to learn further, um, what details am I not in accordance with? You know, wh what can I teach and what do I need to work on in myself? And it's been an excellent mirror for my continued growth. Um, like I said, some people have been with us all three years as we're in our, our, our junior year right now. And, um, you know, these are ceremonies. They're five day ceremonies we have at the end of the summit or at the end of the, the trimester. And each summit is uniquely special. We've gone to Tulum and Costa Rica um, next year we'll be keeping it stateside. We have people from all over the world, you know, and, and during lockdowns, people really jumping through hoops to get there. We have a lady in the UK that wasn't allowed to fly to the U S she flew to Lithuania, drove to Croatia and then flew out of Croatia. I mean, like the wow. people that are in are about it and there's no two ways about it. That, that, that little screenshot you got right there is us doing a soul wander with Tim Corcoran hmm. we worked with Bill Plotkin, um, Bill Plotkin wrote The Soul of Initiation, fantastic book. So again, we we give people all the legal experiences that take people deep into themselves. And, you know, the thing that Aubrey never and I never really expected from this is the fact that it 
the sum total of its parts don't even come close to, to what it is. You know, it, it has become a community. Um, and even for the people who come and go, you know, we have an app where everyone who's ever been a part of Fit for Service is allowed in. And, um, and there's, that app is available to everybody, the Fit for Service Academy. Um, it's on, you know, all the, the places you can download an app. It's phenomenal. And I share everything that YouTube wouldn't want me to share with you. I share it there in that app. <laughs> Documentaries, uh, some of the most fantastic articles really summarizing what's really happening over the last year and a half and um, where the powers that be really want to take this. So uh, you get Beautiful. juicy information and you're not just stuck with that. You know, if I eat a bad meal, uh, one of the things I learned over the last year and a half is if I eat a bad, bad meal right before bed, that's really hard to process, digest, and eliminate before sleep. It's going to impact my sleep. So, you know, watching these documentaries, reading these articles, not a good idea to do it right before bed. Um, doing it on those walks where I can contemplate and move it and then lift weights and then play with my family and enjoy life and remember that I am in control of what I'm in control of. And I'm really only in control of my experience here. You know, as I as I work on myself, I become fit to serve. And that service is really done through my vibration. It's done through how I show up in the world. And it's done with all the people that I touch. My family first, my my coworkers, my friends, and everything beyond that. Everybody through the podcast. That reverberation is the trickle that we're creating with Fit for Service, and I think that's really what's drawing people to us is they want to be a part of that, and it's working. Dude, I love it. And the the last thing I want to ask about that is, um, I think because I heard it was it was you, it was Caitlin, it was Eric on Aubrey's podcast, and you were talking about like highlights of might have been 2019 2020 i can't remember what it was but eric's was a sharing circle you know and um it just got me thinking that you know i've been to some ayahuasca ceremonies where the most profound moments are not on ayahuasca they are actually the sharing circles afterwards i would love to know just just quickly but your your sense of like What's this doing for community? How is this is it almost how sacred sons are doing this for like men's circles? How is this um, really showing up for the people, not just the protocol, but the people? Because it really seems tight knit. Yeah, you know, it's people want to know that they're not alone. They want to know that that uh, the things that they're into, the viewpoints that they have, that there is a sense of other people that are doing the work that they can spitball ideas with. and. You know, we've had we, we we took stats the first year on how many businesses formed and all the financial shit. You know, like who who gained, what did you gain, and how did you gain from being a part of this experience? And what's cool now is seeing how many people have been married who met each other in fit for service. We have our first fit for service babies that were born wow. this year from people who met in fit for service, and it's like that to me is the unquantifiable. That to me is mm -hmm. like you started a family, and it's it's really incredible to see that. You know, so people first form this online and then they see like who's near me who lives close to me who else is who else is into this stuff and then they become beacons of light in their own community and that the things and tools that they learn are what they take out to their community so they start to find you know as you build your resonance up that's what you attract into your life and when you find others that are like you in fit for service you begin to find that in your own neighborhood you begin to find that in your own city in your own state and that slowly just seeds the planet with more and more people that are doing the work and healing themselves and coming to a place where they can actually sit with the truth and understand it in a way and still do something useful with it where they can still come to a place of peace and equanimity fully knowing what's on the line right now and say we're going to do it better we will do it better and it starts with me and I have people that are in on this with me and there's people from all walks of life. You know, one of my, one of my best friends that I met during this was a retired hedge fund manager from New York city. Phenomenal, phenomenal guy. And, um, you know, I could go on and on about it, but, um, and even just talking about it, you know, it's something that I tell anybody who's new, it's like describing a plant medicine journey, you know, like I can tell you everything about it. You're not going to know it until you go through it. And really when you go through it, you understand like, okay, yeah, this is something that's the, the words don't really fully encapsulate. It's that, it's that good. And it's that important. Hmm. What one very quick question was that uh, hedge fund manager, Jason, mutual friend, nobody, no, 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 but oh, he's, okay. he's, he's welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jason's man. Awesome. Yeah. He's welcome in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
won't go down that rabbit hole, but he's a guy that I want to get on my podcast for sure. He's a super brilliant fella. But to stay on point, you mentioned a lot of really cool stuff with Fit for Service, and I know there's something that you said before we went on about how you are opening it up to more applicants, taking on more applicants, because apparently, which is good, it's it's selective, but you, you guys had a, a smaller um, – amount of people that you would allow in to the fit for service and now you're opening that up. It it leads me into one of the questions that Jeffrey Cummings, what's up Jeff, um, said on the chat, now you are a loving, dedicated father who appreciates the importance of structure and design and family life, raising children in today's world, what's next? And as I read that, I was thinking, I think I may know what's next and I would love uh, to see if this segues into community talk and, and whatever you want to share with like the future for fit for service and also um, community out your way. Absolutely, brother. Yeah. You know, with fit for service, we, we kept it at 150 people, you know, Dunbar's number because we really wanted to form a cohesive tribe and that was great for the first three years. And then we, we realized like that, that ceiling doesn't actually exist. We're just making it that way. But there is value in that. So we've opened it up um, to allow whoever qualifies to be in. And what we're going to do is split the group in half. So that way we have, or as many times as necessary, and take people through summits that are still under 200 people. That way there's no, you're not, you actually do get a chance to have, make connections and, and really get close to people when you're at the summits. And then at the end of the year in Sedona, we're going to have the big power Oh, wow, with everybody who's been a part of it all year long. And of course, you'll have made friends throughout that, but then you'll get to see the other half. You get to see who else you haven't been going through the summits with. And um, I'm really excited for that. I'm absolutely excited for that. When it comes to what's next, you know, it's it's funny. My future looks a lot like our past. And it's something that's really stuck out to me is that uh, we have to return to harmony with nature. I think that's a given. Um, regenerative agriculture, permaculture, sustainable living, farming, all these things are things that I want to get into. Aubrey just acquired a 120-acre ranch in Texas that I will be uh, a caretaker for the land with my family. So we're looking into um, what type of home we want to build, with what materials. My father was a general contractor for 50 years. He still is. So he's going to come out and we'll have my dad all the way to me and my son all having our hands in that, building our dream home on this property. We're going to have you know, animals and orchard, it's going to look like the biggest little farm. And, you know, there will be a church for medicinal use of plants as well. So really bridging that gap, not just for me, but for the community at large and having a home where we can legally uh, give the one thing that we haven't been able to give people in fit for service. And all the while still giving them everything we're giving them, uh, the kitchen sink of our wisdom, you know, at that time. So I've got a lot on my plate. It feels like I need to get a bachelor's degree in in a lot of different things right now. And, um, you know, the thing that's holding that together is just the thread of trust that I know I'm always provided for. And, um, you know, our interconnectivity, the fact that we, we are one, you know, one with the planet, one with each other. I know that the experts that I need, I'm already connected with. And uh, it's such a beautiful thing to to take a deep breath and just relax into and know that yes, there's a, there's a big hill to climb right now in getting this to look the way that I want it to. But at the same time, those connections are already made. Mm. Man, what an example. I love this. And, uh, one thing that this holds a very special place in my heart because, you know, I literally for the past two months, I've had, um, guests staying at my house and, um, it kind of popped in like out of the flow for me, but that's just how life goes. Like you never know when, uh, I think it was this, um, Heath Ledger film called four feathers. I don't know if you guys saw that one. He, okay. Well, it, w incredible film, but you know, long story short, Heath Ledger found himself from Britain all the way, you know, in Africa somewhere to find his friends who went to war and he didn't. But he decided he was going to go there and help his friends anyway. And he gets kind of like just kind of trashed by the desert and circumstances and left for dead. And this this one lone tribesman sees him. And, you know, it's funny because the whole dynamic is he's annoyed by it, but he like and, and Heath can tell. But he's like, well, why would you save me? Why would you save my life? And he said, because God put you in my way. 
and he just laughed about it. And I, I find that so funny because we have all these expectations of where life should throw us most of the time and, and what it should feel like as life develops. And those unexpected surprises that knock us off our game are the opportunities that give us the chance to, in that moment, be who we know we could be, but we haven't had the opportunity to to grow that way yet. So with that being said, the reason why these people are in my house is because we're talking about the next step. It's it's community. It's the same thing. Like what the future looks like is what the past always was. What held it together for so long wasn't science. And, you know, it, it was I should actually take that back. It's not the modern rendition of science. It's what science always was, which was human centered rather than externalized in data somewhere on a database that's centralized and only a couple people can verify whether it's true or not. It's actually real science is that thing that's earned over time, real wisdom pooled together in society. But then there has to be what you called is harmony with nature. And that also means that we are part of nature. We need to learn what harmony is with human beings without the the filtration through social media or 140 characters, whatever it is really returning to having real life experiences again, which is why I love what I'm hearing about fit for service, but especially about that 120 acre ranch. And I'm hearing about this all over, not just the country, but the world. People are returning to this concept of community. So my wife who has the big vision, Barb, and we'll have her on the podcast here soon. It's about time. She has been spearheading. We we just were out in Austin, met up with you guys, you know, went and stayed at a Hobbit house. One of the friends of the owner of the Hobbit house is somebody who actually lived not just in cults, but in communities. And she says, of course, I learned the bad parts of what a cult is. And I also learned what's actually beautiful about some of these groupings of people. Not all of it is is the bad. A lot of it is the good of harmony of relationship, learning how to come together. So she has her fingers on the dial of how to identify um, what Jamie Wheel would call grabbing the ring of power and um, taking a good idea too far. And so her name is Olivia. She connected with you as well as connected with um, my wife and putting on a summit in Austin about community. So you'll be speaking at it. I'll be speaking at it, probably doing some kind of like, you know, community style exercises, stomping, clapping, creating music in the moment. Um, But beyond all that, I think what I'm hearing from what you and Ob are spearheading out there, and also what I'm hearing here in Tennessee and a lot of other places are, are people are really looking to get back to what has life always been? How can we return to us not outsourcing all this, but taking the bull by the horns and creating the future that we wish to create, like really being the solution that we wish to see in the world? So what I love about that is I would love to talk now a little bit about what your vision is, the blueprint that you feel you know, it can change from location to location, but probably some of the best practices of community. What are you looking forward to as you are the caretaker of the land? And that land also has to be cared for by other people who are there. So what are your boundaries, your parameters for community that you're looking for? And and what kind of blueprints are you looking to um, set forward? Yeah, that is a loaded meatball of a question, brother. Piece uh, by grass, piece, grass man. Finished, grass, <laughs> finished, grass finished meatball. Uh, <laughs> you know, I have I have a lot to learn. There's no doubt about it. You know, I think I think the first the first things that are on my mind really have been architecture. You know, what are we going to build? And and uh, I just had a meeting with Monsel, who has been on my podcast. He does sacred hunting and is a beautiful human. He knows a lot about regenerative agriculture. I'm wearing uh, my buddy's uh, t-shirt over at Rome Ranch. Um, they're out in Fredericksburg and, and they've got, you know, a giant Buffalo herd out there on 1500 acres. So like I said, I am already connected in many ways, uh, not just spiritually, but, but, but literally connected to some of the experts that I need we're going to have a herd of black buck. Uh, we're going to have some domesticated animals and we're, are really, my job will be to restore the soil to its original capacity. Um, and you know I've had these guys on the podcast before, so this is something that I'll be I'll be working with them directly on. 
and you know building that garden of eden really getting the orchard right getting the plants right getting the greenhouses right so we can be fully sustained with ourselves rainwater collection solar power batteries the whole deal and uh and living off grid speaking directly to the community side you know there is there are a couple parameters that are, you know first and foremost and the experts that i've spoken to about community you have to have a working myth you know paul check did an excellent podcast maybe you guys can link to in the show notes on tribe I think it's three hours long. It was a solo cast. And we have to have a shared myth. It doesn't mean we all have to have the shared religion or that we all have to have, um, you know, the shared, the exact same beliefs and things, but we have to have a shared myth about what it is we are creating together. And then we have to have some fail safes put in. You know, we have to have a process for working things out intelligently with emotional intelligence um, when things go wrong. Because anytime you're in community, you're going to have that. You're going to have hiccups. You're going to have um, problems within relationship. You know, I was talking with Dr. Will Tegel. He's out uh, in Wimberley, Texas, not far from me. He wrote the book Walking with Bears, one of my all-time favorite books. A true elder in every sense of the word. He's he's 80, and he's a Native American elder as well. So he's really an elder. Um, one of the things he talked about, he's buddies with the guys at Dominer, and I think they have a documentary available now on Netflix for people to check out, but they have one of the longest standing and largest communities with over a thousand people in Northern Italy. And the art that they come up with is psychedelic and absolutely gorgeous. They do their own food, hundred percent organic and biodynamic. And they said the number one problem, I haven't seen the documentary yet, but according to Mm -hmm. Will, the number one problem they have is sex. It's, it's relationships. It's all the sticky shit that people rush up against when they're in love. And um, they're not a sex cult. You know, this isn't like some weird shit where everybody's got to fuck the guru. It's just human nature when you live in close proximity and you love people and you have a shared vision that things like that come up. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm a novice when it comes to any of this stuff. And that's why it was funny when Olivia asked me to speak. I was like, I can speak about the things that I know about, but there's a lot that I don't know. I have no problem admitting that, you know, what, one of the things we want to do is take it piece by piece and build it slowly in every way possible. You know, we get our, get our, our house on the ranch first, um, bring in the animals and start to restore the soil and bring in the, uh, the plants and bring in other people who are experts in those fields that come and not, don't necessarily live there at first, but start to build that community with the group of like-minded people and, and, you know, see a need, fill a need. If there's a need for certain people to be on the property, they're obviously going to be sought after. So when it comes to certain things, like really understanding your attributes as a person, if this is something you want to be a part of, how do you fit in? How, what do you bring to the table? You know, and, and that's different for everybody. It doesn't mean you have to have, you know, the 20 years of regenerative agriculture. It could be anything. It could be that you're great with kids. We're going to be homeschooling and a lot of, you know, I think anybody else who lives there is going to be homeschooling on that ranch. And I think that's, you know, going to require people who have patients who know how to play that didn't forget as adults what it's like to play with a kid, how to think like a kid. All that stuff matters. And if people get really clear on doing the work on themselves, they're going to know they have many gifts to offer. So I think, you know, really understanding that we can take this slowly and build it correctly and do it right and then still recognize that that. We're going to rush up against many problems, just like all communities do. And to accept that fact and to say yes to it anyways, I think is the move. Mm. Shared community or shared myth that, uh, that struck me deep. The reason I like that is because, um, I like how Charles Eisenstein talks about myth and Charles, he, he speaks about it as in, we're really talking about that, that thing that science has a very hard time nailing down but is so ever present you can't deny its existence um there's there's always a narrative going around and there's always this these deep grooves that we fall into so i like that shared myth and it's 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 part and parcel to like what is it that you're building and what are you drawing from what is the past and the ancestry and the lineage and the the shoulders of giants that you're building from and and then for what how are you going to honor all of that greatness that came before to to put it into motion so our children are our children's children and seven generations beyond can experience the the height of our myth the the highest optimal um expression 
of our myth. So I absolutely love that part. I also have to say that in it, it, he might have hopped out, but Paul Check also popped in right as you were talking about him into the chat. And he was like, hey, Ben and Kyle, sending lots of love to my soul brothers. Um, just have to say it again. Paul is a living legend. Please go check out Paul Check's work. Um, just incredible, incredible stuff. To stay on point with the community thing. So like I'm in all these text threads, which I used to not like, but now it really, it's just these conversations I don't have to chime in on all the time, but I do get very valuable information. And m like my wife is just incredible finding these things. She's finding all these different communities that are around with themes. And one of them is hmm. a bio, a biohacking theme. So Konos, I think I've even found these people before. Konos, K-O-N-O-S, I think it's in North Carolina. A regenerative community of sufficient, a regenerative community sufficient tribe living in harmony with nature. And part of their themes is biohacking, is really tapping into, and again, this is something Jamie Wheel said, is what like biohacking and play and natural movement and all of these things have really, been aiming at is cracking the human out of the conditioned zoo animal that we've become. So um, I just I love the I, I love talking about these things because what comes up is then in the chat you'll have some people that are like oh I heard about this, and they'll they'll post something in there about yet again another kind of community that's out there. And I think what's happening is here is the seeds are being planted. Community wants to be had. Now it's like the best practices and the most um, informed and wise people out there who are chiming in and weighing in on it are you know, basically showing what are the legitimate time tested aspects of community like you were saying like you know you can't get around it humans in close proximity sometimes they fight sometimes they have sex sometimes you know they you know they're in accord and in balance sometimes they have aberrant frequencies they're not in harmony what does it all mean what is the greater gift and the lesson of it um i like the fact that this forward movement is showing that man you community doesn't have to look like what it may have looked like back in the 60s and 70s either it's it's updated to today with all of the best practices and all the information for all the youtube university you know kids out there there's a lot of amazing ideas that are coming out here so i want to i want to lead this into what you know one of the final places that i want to take all of this and it's something that we talked about on the podcast that when i was on your podcast kyle we talked about technology and the direction that technology seems to be headed now I just want to get you know a brief idea of you know, you're you're hip to and aware of where a lot of some of these agendas that you mentioned earlier are headed. How do you stay in balance in a world that is very obviously moving in many di several different directions at once, but some of it you know like technology, um, EMFs, uh, the constant consumption of information that doesn't come from nature, it comes filtered through a machine. What are your thoughts on that? And you use technology a lot. You, you know, I use technology a lot. We have to stay in peak optimal health. What are your best practices and what have you found is maybe the, the glaring upside to the use of technology, but the, the caution of balance for you? And your family, because you have young kids. This is yeah, this is a great question, and, and it is it does have to be my last because I'm I'm a little bit over where I thought we were going, but this has been juicy and well worth it, brother. Uh -huh. um, the I'll, I'll give people a book to read if they really want to know the cost of technology. It's called The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg. Dr. Thomas Cowan was on my podcast. He recommended that book, and it is mind blowing. It's on Audible as well. If people like to listen, um, I mostly listen to the books that I that I check out. Um, I will say, you know, we, we live in a world where there's a need for technology. Obviously, I wouldn't I wouldn't have a job without it. Even even when I think of fit for service, um, that people know about fit for service through the podcast, but not through Instagram. They know about it through um, the channels that are available to people through technology. The key is, you know, when do you have that off switch? You know, when when do I park my phone and not look at it again? And do I have the discipline to do that? Uh, for a long time, my wife had a vision on psilocybin mushrooms to get rid of our TV, and we gave it away to our friends, and we didn't have a TV for three years. And that's because when Bear was two, we were already arguing with a two-year-old of why we weren't watching TV all the time. He was already addicted to it. 
Um, the people, you know, Steve Jobs, a lot of the people that created this technology say they would never give their kids an iPad or never give them an iPhone. And yet you see it all the time. I mean, it's unavoidable, you know, so we leave certain things like devices for airplane flights and, and long uh, road trips and things like that. So it's a special treat when they actually get it. And there's no grab at that when we're home. I mean, it's completely off limits. Uh, I'll watch TV with Bear. We watch nothing on cable television. We don't have cable. We'll watch movies and things like that, documentaries um, on occasion. He wanted, you know, he's obsessed with natural disasters. So we watched Twister the other night. It's not a highly informative <laughs> documentary. It's a comedy. There's some adult humor. Um, but that was a cool way to just unwind. So I'm not against, uh, completely against, you know, even just the entertainment aspects of technology, but at the same time, that's not the bread and butter, you know, bears of martial arts. He's homeschooled. We're out in nature constantly. You know, we go to Barton Springs, we got stand up paddle boards. We're, um, we're, we're doing some road trips and some different trips this year where we're going to get to go see family, uh, my family out in California, my wife's family out in Arizona. So that a lot of learning takes place there, you know, and, and there's great books that come through technology too. You know, the magic Treehouse series is available on audible and that's incredible. That's made car long car rides like doable. It's, I wish I had that when I was a kid and we learn through story, you know, that's such an important piece. So the ability for the kids to learn through story and, and touch different aspects of what it means to be human. I think, um, the author of Magic Treehouse does such an incredible job with that. So kudos to her. One of the ways that I mitigate EMF and things of that nature is first and foremost, connecting to the ground. I think people by now have heard of grounding. You can also uh, get grounded through cold water. You know, there's negative ions. The ocean is the best source, but a cold plunge will do very well for that as well. And then um, whether Paul's on or not, check out his podcast, Living 4D, with Doria and Dr. Ibrahim Karim who started the Institute of Biogeometry.ca. These guys, and you can view it all on the website too, Biogeometry.ca, it'll blow your mind. They have a ton of different verified scientific studies that they've done in ways that they have optimized nature itself with you know, their ability to change the subtle energy of some of these giant 5G towers to something that is more harmonic and in resonance with what nature wants. And one of the six studies that they have verified here is, I think it was with the country of Switzerland or Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, they were actually able to change because once the towers, the 5G towers came in, it actually started affecting the birth rate of their cattle and the grass growth started to change. It started to turn brown. You know, this is just what happened, right? So the country sought them out and asked them to fix this. He said, take the towers down. They said, we can't do that. We've invested too much. And he was able to tune the frequency of these things, not to limit 5G, but to piggyback upon the 5G wave, something that's more, more harmonic and in tune with what our bodies want and what nature wants. And seemingly overnight, the, the cattle returned to their normal state of health. The grass started growing six feet tall again. And that's just one of several different ways that he's proven the validity of this stuff. I think it's, it's absolutely essential in the modern world. And if you don't read The Invisible Rainbow, you'll understand very quickly uh, what we're up against here. But again, I am able to rest at night because I know there are experts all over the world that have really made it their life's work to solve each individual problem. When we start to connect those dots as, uh, as humanity recognizes itself one within the sacred hoop of nature, one with nature, not separate from it, one with God, not separate from it. When we come to fundamentally understand that anything is possible. And I see this, you know, divide as going further and further. And at the same time, those who choose to be of the land and not live on a smart grid and um, accept health as their number one responsibility. Uh, I see a bright future for those that choose that path. Dude, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, dude. Um, I just have to say, Paul Check chimed in towards the end there and said, technology is like a shovel or hammer. Great to get a job done, but uncomfortable to sleep with. Classic <laughs> Paul <laughs> Check. I love it. Love this guy. And, and seriously, yeah. Thank you so much um, for how you laid that out, man. So perfect. Um, we could go on and on, but I want to make sure that the audience knows how to find you, um, what you want them to know about, how they can um, check out everything you're up to. So we can pull up the, the website. Is this where you would send them? 
No, I mean, my website, I haven't updated it at all since, uh, you know, like maybe mid quarantine, we relaunched it, but I haven't done a lot there. You know, uh, an easy way to contact me is is if you're on Instagram uh, at living with the Kingsburys. That's my wife and I. We have a joint account. Uh, DMs there. I do answer. She lets me know when there's one. It's something I don't check often, but she lets me know if somebody's got questions there. Um, of course, if you join the Fit for Service Academy app, uh, it does cost I think like eight dollars a month. But I'm super active there. I answer any and all questions. And I'm posting all the good juicy stuff. So that's a great way to stay in contact with me. And then the Kyle Kingsbury podcast. That's where I'm delivering the guys like Del Big Tree, Mickey Willis, Dr. David E. Martin. We just had Dane Wigington on. He did the documentary, The Dimming. Mind-blowingly good documentary. Super important that we understand that as well. So um, podcast is where I'm taking a deep dive with these people, just like you. You know, I take a deep dive with people that have a lot to say and have a, a wealth of knowledge on various aspects. Sometimes um, it's an ugly truth. And sometimes it's the beautiful light that allows us to navigate the waters that we're in. Mm. Well so said. real, man, well dude. So well said. Um, I can't say enough, man, that I really appreciate. Um, I could feel the practices alive in you. Everything that you said you were going for at the beginning, I can feel that alive in you. I also love that, you know, shining example of humility as well, which is one of those, those classic tests of character that you know when somebody has really felt real true love when when they could just stay humble amidst all the craziness of life so thank you for what you're doing man i love you i love your family my whole family loves your family can't wait to get back out to austin and chill again absolutely brother i love you give a big hug and a kiss to barb and the kids love you guys we will do all right ladies and gentlemen we do this every thursday 5 p.m eastern standard time we're just going to leave it at that now Thank you guys for joining us on the Ben Stewart Podcast. Mm -hmm.